King Akbar posed the question to him, what does God do? Well, this was quite a precocious, cheeky young lad. And he said, are you asking me this question as a teacher or a student? And King Akbar said, as a student. Well, said the shepherd boy, what are you doing sitting up there on that throne while I'm standing down here? Oh, 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 said King Akbar. So he immediately walked down from his throne, led the young shepherd boy up and sat him down, put his crown on his head and then went back down and put on the shepherd's cloak. And then King Akbar said, well now, tell me, what does God do? The young boy said, well, he makes shepherd boys into kings and kings into shepherd boys. <laughs> there was a priest who found himself in the assembly of a very great and very revered Sufi. But in his observation, he could see that the Sufi didn't wear any kinds of robes. And he mixed with the assembly of those who were present with a casual intimacy that rendered it impossible to, for him to be any different from any of those who were present. And then the priest overheard a conversation between the, the Sufi and a young man who was there. And their conversation was such that it was like between two schoolboys sharing confidences in the schoolyard. So when the opportunity arose, the priest said to the Sufi, why don't you cultivate awe and respect in these people? If I treated my parishioners like this, nobody would listen to what I have to say, nor would they believe me. The Sufi said, come with me on a journey for a few days. And so the next day, the Sufi, the priest, and the very same young man that the priest had observed in conversation with the Sufi set out on the road. And they hadn't gone too far down the road when the Sufi said, Oh, look at that beautiful flock of sheep over in that paddock. And the priest said, They're not sheep, they're goats. And he was about to get into an argument about it, but then he turned to the young man to get confirmation, and the young man said, they're sheep. Well, they got down the road a bit further, and there was a fruit tree, and, and the Sufi sheikh said, oh, look at those ripe, beautiful, juicy pears. He said, they're not pears, they're apples. Well, he again, looked to the young man for confirmation. The young man said, the pears. So this went on for days, the same thing. Sometimes the Sufi would observe something that the priest didn't see, and sometimes the priest observed things that the Sufi didn't see. But always, when they asked for confirmation from the young man, he agreed with the Sufi. Then they came to a group and the Sufi said, well, oh, look at those soldiers over there. My goodness, they must be getting ready for war. The priest said, they're not soldiers, they're women gathered around the well. Well, they almost got into an argument about it and then they asked the young man. The young man said, they're soldiers. Well, of course, the priest was very frustrated by this and, and in the end he said, I just can't understand it. You do not evoke awe and respect in these people, and yet they agree with everything you say. If I did this to my parishioners and said 
green was blue and blue, they would shun me. They would not listen. There would be no possibility that I could teach them. And the Sufi responded. What did the Sufi respond to the priest? This is to do with that question. What is your relationship with life now? What did the Sufi reply to the priest? How is it that you do not cultivate or evoke awe and respect and yet everyone agrees with what you say. What is your relationship with life? The only way you can answer this question is by reference to your own interaction with the experiences and people that come into your life now. What is the response that we would make to the priest? Thing that the, um, the priest was coming from a place of fear, where he was always considering his parishioners in a particular point of view or a particular way, and that they'll be very demanding of him, and they'll consider if he did this, then they'll do that. Yes. And that was his belief system. That's what he truly believed. Um, However, life's not like that. No. Life has many different points of view. That's right. So what is, what's the underlying, what's the bottom line of that in relationship to these experiences in this state of stillness? Well, if, my feeling was that if the priest lost that fear and was able to uh, be courageous enough to uh, to give different points of view to his parishioners, then he would flow better with life and be more flexible in life and be able to embrace life a lot more than he was. And so are his parishioners, but they seem to be very stable and stuck. Whereas the, um, the sage was very much from the point of view of Let's see different points of view, let's see what life has to offer us, let's see what comes in. And was very open to whatever was going on and seeing things differently. Yes. And was trying to encourage others to do that also. Also. Yes, so there's a bottom line here, isn't it? And it comes back to a fundamental realisation that we've come to ourselves about the nature of life and movement. What is it? What is that bottom line about the nature? and movement of life now in relationship to this place of stillness in which we find ourselves. Names and labels are really great vision. Yes. Isn't that what they were called? Isn't what that, yes. It's true. Absolutely. If you think something is a particular way, then you'll act accordingly and it will be. Yes. But if you're flexible to how things are, you can accept them as they are and they are that. Yes. So it allows you to be much more embracing of whatever is 
and yes. more silent. So again, coming back to that same question, what is it about the movement of life now that we've realized in this place of stillness? First of all, nothing is what it seems. Everything is ephemeral. Everything is transient, isn't it so? So could it be that this is what the Sufi is in party and the young man is agreeing with? Nothing is what it seems. Maybe also that everything is what we expect it to be. Yes. Yes. Well, the women could have been soldiers. They would have, the women could have been soldiers. Soldiers, soldiers of some sort. Yes, yes. Yes. Marching towards some goal or another. Yes. This and that, there are aspects of duality. And we're creating the duality by our creation of separation. Uh -huh. And so that when we all come together in one space of being one, then that is what it is. Yes. And in that way, the, there was no difference between the young man and the Sufi because they were in the same space and they were experiencing the same perception. Perception, yes. There's many of the same stories. But this basically leads us to the place where we can acknowledge, not, and not only know our relationship with life and the transience of life and so forth, but leading us again into that basic question that's been asked over these last days, and that is to obtain an understanding of the nature of emptiness. And that's where all this is leading to. But this is a very important question for us. What is our relationship with life now? Well, it's interesting because when you start going from the Sufi's point of view and uh, you actually see things for what they truly are. They truly are, indeed. Then it becomes quite funny. Yes. And it becomes a game. Yes. You see everything as a game and it's quite... Play. Hilarious. Play. Nothing serious anymore. Yes. <laughs> it's like looking at clouds. Yes. The cloud looks like a. Yes, it is. It is. But it's just a cloud. It's just a cloud. It looks like a dragon. Yes. 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 I've just had a class of um, six, seven year olds the last week and uh, wild, crazy class. But I'm challenged them all the time by saying, things that were quite the opposite to what they are, and you should see their faces. <laughs> Let's look at you. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Challenging them to respond. But come, let's wait, but what did the Sufi say to the priest? How would you sum it up? How would you sum up these various awarenesses in relationship to this Sufi, this priest, where they were coming from, to, to clarify, to bring up to our awareness what it is that we're experiencing in our relationship. What would you reply to that priest in answer to his question? Why don't you evoke awe and respect in the people around you? Why don't you? Because if I did what you're doing, what, what would you say? This is creating division that we're all the same. Right. You know, it's God or whatever, it's all the same. The moment we have labels and, and we create division, we separate ourselves from right. it. Is. Okay, okay. Good answer. Yes. Life has so much to offer. Uh -huh. So appreciate it and embrace it uh -huh. rather than judging it. That right. This is this and that's that. Uh -huh. I also don't like when these people I don't need to impress them. Position 
what he thought of the world, etc. He never asked a question. And there was a question to be asked, what makes you think they're soldiers? What makes you think they're sheep? Yes. Teach me. What what is it do you see that I don't see? He never he never went there. He never went out of his protected space. So it was a barrier to his growth and his curiosity. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten an answer, but at least he could have asked a question. Mm -hmm. Because it's true that the logical mind sees what it's taught to see, like the kids. Kids are like, I was taught to, you know, recognize certain things and certain things in a certain way. And kids get really solid behind that. I know I, I was in a kid's production of drama, and oh my god, you're supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that, you've got to stay here, you drove oh, me nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't grow if you've got this protected position.